Okay, look, here's your modules. There's your course contract, your syllabus, your course calendar, my office hours. We are to read chapter 11, look over the PowerPoints, and there's no videos in the modules for this one. It's really just like the body parts. Are y'all ready? Yes, okay. So we're going to talk about the female and male sexual development. I mean, I can wait. Um, from prenatal life through sexual maturity. Talking about the anatomy of the reproductive system, the normal function of those systems, the structure, and the function of the female breasts. Next week, we'll go over chapter 12 and 13. So this is chapter 11 in your book, and we'll start off talking about the genetic sex is determined at conception. There are um, these chromosomes that are um, going to identify whether or not you're a male or female. If you are female, you have two X chromosomes, and if you are a male, you have an X and a Y. The reproductive systems for both males and females are similar in the, for the first six weeks until they really start to identify themselves. Um, external genitalia is completed at about the 12-week mark. <coughs> the ovum, the egg, carries the X chromosome, and the sperm is either going to carry the X or the Y. So the ovum, the egg from the female is always an X, always an X. Every conception is supposed to be a girl unless that sperm says, I'm, I'm a Y. That's how we get males, okay? So all the eggs carry the Xs. You'll never find an egg carry a Y. The sperm determines if I'm gonna be a boy or a girl because I'm carrying an X or a Y. Sex glands are inactive during infancy and childhood until the hypothalamus stimulates the gonads to produce hormones at sexual maturity. Reproductive organs start to become functional and puberty is when those secondary sex characteristics, uh, primary and secondary sex characteristics occur. The primary sex characteristics are um, the maturation of the ova in the ovaries and the production of sperm in the testes. Secondary sex characteristics differentiate males from females um, but do not relate to production, so it's either hair or breast development. Testosterone is what causes the development of organs and genitalia in men and estrogen is present but not needed to develop the female organs. All females have sexual structures um, unless that Y exists. So. All right, sexual maturation. <clears throat> Puberty occurs in an orderly sequence. The hypothalamus secretes the gonadotropin releasing hormone increases about age 9 to 12. That um, hormone stimulates your anterior pituitary to mm -hmm. um, secrete the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. The follicle, the FSH, uh, follicle stimulating hormone, in men, it controls the production of sperm. In women, it controls the menstrual cycle and stimulates the growth of the eggs in the ovaries. The LH in men causes the testes to make testosterone and the LH in women causes those ovaries to release the egg to control the cycle. Reproductive cells are called gametes. Um, these mature in response to higher levels of FSH and LH. 
and then you start to have those secondary sex characteristics occur. Female puberty. Um, typically around 8 to 13, it's different for everyone. Um, the pelvis widens, fat deposits at the hip, um, pubic hair and then axillary hair, depending upon your ethnic background. Some um, ethnicities don't have a lot of hair growth. Estrogen causes skeletal growth to be um, rapid at first. So girls will sprout up um, first and then um, their growth spout spurts are shorter. Men during puberty, it, they, um, their bones grow at a slower rate, so it takes them longer to get taller than the females. Menarche is um, when um, we have our first cycle and our breast development. So typically your breasts will develop first and then you'll start to have your first cycle. Amenorrhea is whenever you're not having a cycle by the age of 16. And this, these PowerPoints follow along in your book, like straight to the point. They should be right on. Can you spell amenorrhea? A-M-E-N-O. R R H E A primary no period by the age of 16 primary secondary amenorrhea is whenever you don't have a cycle um, for an extended period of time after you've established your cycles so for some reason you started your your first period you your menarche and then it just stops for at least three months or three cycles whatever's normal for you it just stops puberty for female ranges um, due to size and weight. So the more obese growth <laughs> hormones are going on, the sooner you will hit pu puberty or start the cycle in females. The more small, maybe undernourished, failure to thrive, um, they have delayed onset of puberty. Typically females will um, hit puberty six months to a year before males. And remember, our breasts develop before we um, hit our first cycle. And the changes in the breasts, the um, areola and the nipple become larger. Then the ductal and glandular tissue start to develop within the breast. And typically, both breasts don't mature at the same rate. So um, you may notice that in the early stages of puberty, your females will have lopsided measurements of breasts due to those fat deposits. All right, male puberty. Spermatido spermatogenesis is when the um, testes are forming the sperm. That's pretty much um, the differentiating factor for men. That's when they start to form the sperm. Females have eggs <coughs> like at birth, but men have to start making sperm. <laughs> development of testes and penis usually around nine sometimes as late as 17 years of age for men we need to prep these young men um, about nocturnal emissions tell them what they are it's spontaneous it's nothing that they did wrong um, and it's an ejaculation of seminal fluid the body here for men usually starts at the base of the penis and then goes up the torso two years or so later hits the um, underarms and the face. It's different for different ethnicities. Testosterone is what causes the muscle mass um, to be about 50% more in men than fem females. And remember we talked about the skeletal growth. Um, it starts after females, but it lasts longer. So they grow slower, but longer. And then for men, we have these voice changes due to an enlarged larynx that deepens the voice. Um, usually at the first, it's a cracking and squeaking. So what is the hormone that stimulates all of these things in the men? The hormone? Testosterone. testosterone. What's my hormone in, for my ladies? Yes. Okay. The testes also change in men. They get darker, thinner, 
and larger. About a year later, that's when the circumference and length of the penis will start to um, progress. At some point, females decline in fertility, whereas men can go on continuously making these sperm because they are making sperm. We were born with eggs. <clears throat> when we run out, we run out. Um, typically, um, it decreases around 45 to 50 years old. Hormones decline, our reproductive organs atrophy. The final menstrual cycle is called menopause. That's our last cycle. We are now done with cycles. There's no more eggs to release. Um, there's no distinct marker for men. They can still decline, but they can still father children until they no longer work. Okay, external female reproductive organs. We have our mons pubis, which is the rounded, fleshy fat deposit at the very top, up here. Your labia majora are the darker outer folds. Your minor are the inner folds. That's, that's the um, labia that actually protects your meatuses and your vaginal opening, the minor, 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 smaller, major, majora, larger, out. Um, your vestibule is your um, minora, your skein duct, your majora, and your Bartholomew duct opening. Within that is located your clitoris, which is the sensitive part for females. Um, and then the perineum is considered all of the pelvic support structures. So all right here. Can y'all see that on the screen? Yeah. Where is your urethra? Where is it? What, what's? In between. At the top, right? So in between what? The clitoris. Okay, so is my urethra in my vestibule? Yeah. Yeah, yep it is. Okay. Your skin and Bartholomew glands are there as well. Okay, internal female. We have our vagina and our other reproductive organs internally. The vagina is a muscular tube of uh, membranous tissue. It's usually about three to four inches. It has multiple folds. It is uh, lubricated by secretions of that Bartholin gland. It allows menstrual flow to exit the uterus. Um, so the menstrual cycle is a buildup of uterine lining. And if it doesn't need to stay there to support a pregnancy, it sloughs off and it goes through the vagina, through the cervix, through the vagina, and out of the body. So that's part of the vagina's role. The other one is it is the um, organ of coitus for females. It's the passage of the fetus. And so the vagina has more than um, just one role. Okay, look at this picture. You see this is your cervix. This is what the baby comes through. It is actually the neck of your uterus. So if you look at the female anatomy, you've got the uterus comes down into a bottleneck, which is the cervix. The cervix is at the back of the vagina, the vagina out to the body, okay? So that's the makeup. So just look at your book to know um, that. So there's your cervix. Here is that um, labia minora that's gonna protect it, and then your outer labia, your majora. Internal organs, the uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries. <clears throat> okay, so here is a bigger picture. Here's our vagina. There's your cervix. See how it's just the base of the uterus? At the top corners of the uterus are the fallopian tubes that go to the ovaries. Ligaments and um, supportive structures hold this all in place. Well, it's supposed to, unless you have a prolapse after 20 kids, but that is the makeup of the, the female internal reproductive organs. So the uterus is divided in 
to three different sections. Your corpus, which is your upper fundus area, right here. The fundus of the uterus is the upper portion. Your isthmus, which is the midsection, and then the cervix, which is your bottom section. Your cervix is typically two to three centimeters in length. And then your uterus is also made up of outer, inner, um, and mid um, layers too. The perimetrium is your outer layer of your uterus, your myometrium is the mid, and your endometrium is the internal layer of your uterus. So the endometrium is where um, the baby would attach, right? The outer layer is what's in your um, peritoneal cavity. All right, the fallopian tubes. This is where the ovum passes through, becomes um, impregnated or the sperm meet. Together they travel down here to implant and make a pregnancy. So the egg is released from these ovaries, travels down the fallopian tube, um, conception happens, and then the pregnancy occurs. So the fallopian tubes are lined with cilia to propel this egg on the way down this tube. Remember your ovaries contain all of the eggs that you're going to have at birth. They produce the sex hormones to release mature um, ovum each monthly cycle. And although females are born with about 2 million eggs, only about 400 would mature. Okay, let's talk about the pelvis bone and the support structures of our reproductive system. There is a false and true pelvis. The false is the upper. We call it that because really like the fetus doesn't have to pass through that, right? It's just, it just kind of sits and, and holds everything. The true pelvis is right here um, at the bottom where the fetus is passing through. Which one? True. Baby goes through the true. Bottom. This is on page 189 in your book. Different women have different shaped pelvises. Some are very narrow, some are very wide. What's the baby gonna fit through? The wide one. The wide one, right? So if I already know that I have a pelvic fracture or pelvic problems, I may need to have a C-section or just not get pregnant at all, right? Or adopt or something. This pelvic arch, is telling the doctors how much room the baby has to get out. The ischial spines um, is going to let us know if the baby is fitting through this pelvis during labor and delivery. All right, let's talk about the ligaments that are supporting everything in place. Lateral support is your broad ligaments. It holds your uterus and ovaries in place. Anterior support. Do you want to? Thanks. Her name is Ariel, the teacher. And just tell her it's super loud. Um, our posterior support is your uterosacral ligament. A lot of times as our uterus grows and gets larger and heavier, um, a lot of females will con will complain of um, like a pulling sharp sensation and that's these ligaments stretching out trying to hold up this heavier <coughs> uterus. And a lot of that is called round ligament pain. Wait, you said, you said posterior or anterior? Mm -hmm. So posterior at first, maybe even anterior? We're talking about, sorry. Round uterus. ligament pain? Let's, yeah, repeat that one time. Okay, so as the uterus starts to grow and gets heavier with this fetus in it, these l ligaments are um, having to work harder to hold this heavy uterus in place. And a lot of the pain that they experience is in the round ligament pain. So all of the three ligaments together is round ligament pain, not just like posterior or anterior specifically. 
No, your round ligament specifically holds up that. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Just yes. It's, you're going to feel it in the anterior support of your round ligament. Mm -hmm. But it's pulling from all different directions to hold this sucker in the cavity where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. But um, the majority of the time, they're going to complain of that anterior support pain. And this as they get older? Um, as the fetus gets larger. Oh, fetus yeah. Oh, oh, okay. During pregnancy, like right now, my ligaments aren't having any problems holding my uterus up, right? But if I'm pregnant, then it's going to get heavier. Those ligaments are like, hang on, I can't hold this thing so, anymore. So the round ligaments is like the skeletal structure over, <coughs> and, the, and the, the broad ligament kind of lays like a sheet over. Is, is that what, I mean, that's what it looks like. Yeah. Looks like a, you know. Yes, our broad ligament which is going to pull on the yeah. sides and yeah. hold it up. Our round ligaments pulls everything forward. And then our uterosacral ligament is holding everything. So it's like a TP. It's got to have support from all sides. Okay. 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 Um, blood supply, uterine arteries and ovarian arteries support this blood supply. And then um, nerve supply is from T12 through L2. For the most part, the cycle is 28 days. That's a normal cycle if you're textbook. Not all females are textbook. The process occurs when an ovum, the egg, which contains which chromosome? X. Matures. You are a Y, mister. We are X's. I'm not going to pretend I'm Oh, you didn't read? You didn't get up at midnight and read? <laughs> okay, so the X carrying ovum, the egg, ovum, and the ovary matures. The ovary says, ha, huh, you're mature. Get out. It's released by the ovary. It's picked up by the um, tentacles of the fallopian tube. The cilia travel it through the tube where it hopes to meet a sperm with a what chromosome? Y. Or? Or X. Okay. A regular. <laughs> um, and then they bond together, we conceive a baby, and then we move on through. That is the process of the ovum. Okay. Well, the uterus has to get ready for this meeting of sperm and egg, or not, if it didn't happen. And so do the breasts. All that happens every 28 days. So our ovum matures, ovulation, which is the release of the egg, occurs. Your body prepares to maintain the pregnancy. The uterine lining thickens to prep for the fertilized ovum to implant and start to grow. If no fertilization occurs, it's not going to implant. And then the uterine lining, which what layer of the uterine lining is on the inside? Yeah. Will slough off and you'll bleed and you'll have your cycle and you're done. Okay? So, that, only, so only one ovum. Now, is that from each ovary matures? Or it's just supposed, one? no, your textbook, it's supposed to be one mature ovum from one ovary released to one fallopian tube met by one sperm okay. implanted into the uterus. Okay. Can you release sperm? more than one egg at a time? Yes. Yeah. Can two sperm get up there and meet them at the same time and you have two different eggs and different sperms making a pregnancy in my belly? Yes. Textbook, it's one and one and one and one. All right, some other things change during that 28-day cycle. Our cervical mucus starts to um, change as well. So cervical mucus is scant, um, but it's thick and sticky. And just before that mature egg is released, it says, oh, I need to get a little bit thinner so sperm can get through me and make it up way up there through my uterus, up into my fallopian tube, and impregnate that ovum, right? So just before ovulation, it becomes thin, clear, and elastic. That change is called the um, spin bar key change, spin bar key. So the cervix is protecting 
your female body from this foreign object of sperm until it wants you to get pregnant during your cycle and then it gets thinner and not so um, sperm destroying to let the sperm through. All right, let's talk about breast changes. What horm <clears throat> hormone, oh shoot, it's on my screen. <laughs> estrogen changes everything. <clears throat> High levels of estrogen and progesterone are needed to um, support um, a pregnancy. Prolactin is secreted by your anterior pituitary to um, make milk production. Once we deliver a baby and the baby is suckling at the breast, we're going to make more milk because we know that we're breastfeeding. If that doesn't occur, all of this dries up and should go away. Okay, male reproductive organs. Oh, bother. What's here? Hang on just a second. Okay. God bless you. Okay, so they have um, externally a penis and a scrotum. The penis is going to carry urine and sperm. Arteries dilate, trapping blood, which causes the erection. The scrotum, which become darker, thinner, um, and larger with puberty, um, house the septum and the testes on each side. Um, there is a muscle that's going to adjust the size, shape, and proximity to the body um, of the scrotal sac that will keep the testes cooler than core body temperature because we don't want to cook these sperm. We need them at the right temperature. So when it's cold outside, that muscle draws up and keeps um, the testes warmer <laughs> to, um, because, you know, they're making sperm and they want to keep them alive and have some good, good sperm. Internally, they have the testes and the accessory ducts and glands. The testes are the endocrine glands that produce the sperm. The accessory ducts and glands allow for the sperm to travel through the um, penis and become motile. Do this you is know the name of the muscle. It's in your book. Okay. I just—it's not in my head, but it's in okay. your book. Um. And this is on page 193 in your book. Do men have cycles of making sperm? Yes. No. no. They're constantly doing it. Always working. <laughs> we have a cycle. We, um, we are producing mature um, ovum, right? We're developing this mature egg. They're just constantly making sperm that have that chromosome that they need to carry and a tail that needs to get them to where they need to go. I think what she was asking was, like, we're looking at this picture with all these different muscles and uh, tubes there. Yeah. Uh, we need to know this for the test, or maybe... The muscle... Maybe in it, or... Yeah, the, that's what... The we, muscle that keeps the sperm alive is probably a good test question. Sure, okay. Because if it's not working, maybe you're not going to be able to father children. Because mm. you, you don't have... That's really... okay with me. <laughs> Probably okay with that child. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone print the PowerPoint? Me. What's your next slide? Male reproductive system. Chapter. Chapter? Okay, good. Okay, how do I get that? It's on Where this is one that? you just uploaded this morning. It's on that one. Right? It's why is it here? I put it there. Under modules. It's showing up on mine. Yeah, it's on mine. Right here. <coughs> right? Mm-hmm. Maybe not down. No, because I don't know. Uh, no, it's not up there because we have everything. We have twenty nine slides. But you got this off of modules. Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Mm -hmm. This morning. I played it this morning. So have you refreshed it since you? I mean, yeah. Just a minute. 
I want my Wednesday people to see it, so I need to have that right here. <laughs> if this doesn't work, I can log in into mine and can pull it up to my module. Yeah, okay. Okay. yeah, Cream Master. That's a funny name. Cream Master Master. <laughs> That should be it. It's got 29 slides. Yeah. Go to so seven, slide 17. Wednesday's group does not have the one that they need to have, and I will upload that for you guys. Okay. So this is where um, we switch over to your med search book, chapter 59. And I checked it last night, and it pretty much goes with it. Okay, so you don't have to have it. You have the slide? Yes. Girl, you're good. Um, Miss Covington or Miss Tammy? Your teachers from second level should have gone over the assessment of the stuff that we're talking about. I'm not teaching you the entire chapter. I'm teaching you parts of the male body that may interfere with like infertility or having babies or something like that, right? Okay. So the male reproductive system um, includes conditions that affect both reproductive and sexuality plus urination. So it's all, that's its purpose. Um, this could be sensitive subject for men, so just make sure that you um, provide mm -hmm. privacy. A lot of times, instead of just saying I have a problem with something, they'll appreciate information on things. So if um, erectile dysfunction is not something that they want to talk about, but you give them a pamphlet, um, you can give them the information without embarrassing them. And some people could care less, they'll tell you everything. So erectile dysfunction, uh, and this starts on page 1752 in your med search book. <clears throat> it could be because of some psychogenic cause, an organic cause, or medication-associated cause. Um, so to get an erection, the parasympathetic and sympathetic components release nitric oxide, which activates smooth muscle relaxation um, to allow increased blood flow into the penis, which will maintain an erection. That's the function. So if um, some problem is um, preventing that from happening, we need to look at what's the cause. And here are some of those um, causes. Another problem that men may have is some ejaculation problems. Um, premature ejaculation is just before you're desired to um, ejaculate, so you um, didn't want to ejaculate that soon. And sometimes it's uh, under no control over you. Um, sometimes it's as soon as there's penetration and ejaculation occurs. And then the other one is retrograde. So instead of exiting the penis, it actually, the sperm actually goes back into the bladder. Retrograde, so there's some sort of obstruction or structure function that's not um, working right. It goes back into the bladder. In the bladder, retrograde goes into the bladder instead of exiting the penis. Some um, medical management for this erectile dysfunction. There are medications like the Viagra, the Cialis, 
There are lots of side effects with that. It's in, increasing the blood flow, right? So if you have too much cardiac output and heart problems, you probably can't take those. Um, flushing of the face. Um, and then another complication may be like the persistent painful erection. It won't go away. There's also some gels. There's implants um, that can be used like a pump, like a penile pump that will um, create an erection. And then there's the negative pressure, like the vacuum contraption. And these uh, pictures and explanations and contraindications are all on page 1758 and 1759 in your med search book. Okay. Okay. The prostate is another internal um, male organ. You can have prostatitis, which is an inflammation, or you can have like benign prostate um, hyperplasia. There are types one, two, three, and four. Typically your prostatitis is um, like an, an infection agent that gets in. E. coli is the number one agent that causes prostatitis. Your symptoms are fever and pain with urinary symptoms, so frequency ur urgency. We treat it by treating the infective agent and alleviate the pain. What's the number one um, bacteria for this? E. coli. Okay. This is on page 1761. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, BPH, is an enlarged prostate. This is on page 1762. They're, they're going to come to the clinic or the hospital saying that their, their stream is stopping and starting. They feel like there's an obstruction, something that's not allowing the urine to pass through. Um, also has signs and symptoms of urinary tract infections. Typically, it's slow, develops slow. They don't have any of uh, symptoms um, at first. <clears throat> How do you check um, for prostate? What are some? A rectal exam. Yes, you're a physician. At what age do you start having to have rectal exams? Prostate exams. Oh, I don't know. I'm asking. Okay. Why would a 35-year-old be going to the doctor to get his prostate checked? Family history. Perfect. Penny, what did you say? Why would a 35-year-old because he's having these issues? Or family history. So um, there's a familial link. To treat. Um, is to relieve the signs and symptoms, relieve the obstruction, and improve urine flow. That's the goal for treatment. We can do that with terazosin. That's your alpha adrenergic blocker that will increase the flow by relaxing the bladder neck and the prostate. There are hormone meds to re reduce the prostate size, which is going to allow that urine to pass through. Um, if we have severe obstruction and we have a patient report to the ER, we may have to cath him in order to, to get the urine out. Cath? Oh. Cath. Catheter. Yeah. Surgical treatment, we can do minimally invasive, which is the TUMT. This is just heat to the prostate tissue, which is going to destroy the tissue. So we kind of heat it up, it destroys the tissue, it sloughs off or the body reabsorbs it. Um, and that's going to make it smaller so that you're in less pain, urine can flow through. There's surgical resection, like a TERP, a transurethral resection of the prostate where they'll remove it. Um, they try not to do the chemo and radiation and things like that. They try to just take it out that way through the TERP. And this is on page 1763 through 64. All right, prostate cancer. It's like one of the most common cancers in men. There's an increase um, in family predisposition, African-American males, 
and the older you get, your, the higher your risk go. Remember, it's um, or, most things with the prostate are slow to develop, so a lot of times you may not have symptoms at the beginning. <coughs> Those symptoms are going to be the same with your prostatitis, is that um, urinary obstruction, very painful ejaculation, and a lot of times we don't know that we have it until it's already metastasized somewhere else. Treatment is based on life expectancy of that older adult, the risk of reoccurrence, how large the tumor is, or their personal preferences, if they don't want any treatment or not. Does having BPH put you more at risk for actual cancer? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know. Y'all phones? Google it. Gotcha. Slays on it. I will test what is on my PowerPoint okay. and from the book. Google says no. Right. Okay. I knew you were. I, I got started <laughs> doing that. Like, <laughs> okay. All right. So um, we're going to run over just a little bit. I'm, or almost done. There are problems affecting the testes, um, the penis itself. So let's go over those. Okay. So. Um, orchitis is an inflammation of the testes, typically due to an infection agent. The agent here is also E. coli, but could it, it could be gonorrhea or chlamydia as well. Epididymi epididymitis is an infection of the urethra, then it goes to the bladder, and then it goes to the prostate, and then it descends down into the epididymis over the testes. Okay, so it typically, it's that E. coli or GC or chlamydia that's moving through the system. So urethra, um, bladder, prostate, and then descends down into the testes where the epididymis lives. Testicular torsion is the twisting of the testes, and then there's testicular cancer as well. Okay, so here's a picture. The blue one is torse. So... Um, those the blood supply of the that testicle starts to twist on itself and if we don't treat this within six hours that um, testes will die okay um, the treatment is to untwist it and then anchor it down in its scrotal sac to keep it there testicular cancer um, almost 95% of people who have it recover from it so it's highly treatable <laughs> It is very common in age 15 to 40. Um, here are the risk factors. So our testes are undescended. We've got a family history. We've had cancer on the other side um, and Caucasians. It is painless. There's a lump or mass on the testes and we diagnose this. Same as women who have um, monthly breast self breast exams, men need to do monthly testicular self exams um, to pick up First, what do they feel like on a baseline? And then that way you'll know if there's something new that's popped up. The treatment is we remove it, we radiate it, or we put some chemo on it. All right, the penis hypospadias is where the urethra is located where? Mm -hmm. On the bottom, not at the tip, on the bottom. Epispadius, mm -hmm. on top. So like a fountain. Um, if I wanted to impregnate a female and I'm shooting it straight up into the vaginal wall, it might be a little bit harder than if it's coming out of the tip, right? And so just think about that. Phimosis is when the foreskin of an uncircumcised male will not retract. It's fixed. Penile cancer is super rare, but one of the carcinomas is known as the Bowen's disease. Priapism is a constant and painful erection caused by what drug? Viagra. All right. Peronis is um, plaque buildups in the corpus cavernosum of the penis. Um, you really can't see it on an unerect penis, but once it gets erect, you can you'll notice um, those that plaque buildup. 
A narrowing of the urethra is possible, and then circumcision is the removal of the foreskin. So all of these will affect the penis. Okay, two tumor markers that may be elevated in testicular cancer are the HCG and the alpha theta protein. True or false? True. True. Fertilization of the ovum takes place in which part of the fallopian tube? Ooh, I didn't cover that. That is in your book, but it's, is it going to be a very narrow part or a very big wide part? Is it? It is. Hang on. B. B. The ampulla. The wider part. Okay, I'm only four minutes over.